How old are you right now? 25. I'm 20, yeah. <laughs> 73. 73 old years. We were born in, both born in 1945 within a couple months of each other. I was born in February. In April. Right? I was born in uh, Lemon Grove, California, of all places. You were born? Here in Seattle. Yeah. Not straight of my family. Uh, they're all from Polish uh, ancestry. And the United States roots are in Ohio. 1945 was not long after the war ended, World War II. My dad and mom, you know, I guess it was just my two brothers then, left Ohio and made their way across country. My dad went to work, I think, for Ryan the Aircraft down there. But then they came up here because my dad got a job, I believe, as an insurance agent. So that's how I got up here. How about you? Oh, I'm a mixed bag. <laughs> uh, my dad was English and Scotch, and uh, I think there were a couple other things in there, but I'm not positive. And my mom was Czechoslovakian and a little Polish that she didn't even know until uh, later in life when she started doing the genealogy. She oh. found that there were some Polish records. I believe both my mom's parents were born in the United States, but my great-grandparents were born in Czechoslovakia. And it was very difficult to get a lot of the genealogy because of the wars and the records. Yeah. A lot of the records were destroyed. Particularly that area. Yeah. So, um... Yeah, my, my uh, folks were both born in, um, in the United States, both in Ohio, with the Lorraine area. But their parents, my grandparents, um, came over from Poland. My mom's mom was actually a translator, I think, at the UN. And so I was here at age of two, and we lived in a uh, kind of Burien area then. So at, at two, you were where? Um, we lived in uh, McMicken Heights when I was two. Um, it's South Seattle, too. Yeah, well, my mom was from New Jersey. She and her sister, my Aunt Betty, uh, traveled across the country. Um, Aunt Betty's fiance was in Seattle. And so they sang in Yodel on the radio in Texas. They just kind of stopped and made their way slowly across the country. And then um, my mom stayed here and got a job at Boeing and she met my dad there. And then she went back to New Jersey. They didn't know each other for very long. And uh, so she went back to New Jersey, and then he wrote her a, mar a letter and said, Oh, hell, will you marry me? <laughs> and so <laughs> she flew back, and they got married. And, uh, yeah, my, my dad, um, I, I don't remember whether he still worked for Boeing, but I know there was a tremendous housing shortage at that particular time. And so they lived with my grandmother in this little itty-bitty house on Beacon Hill with one bedroom, well, they kind of had an upstairs little loft thing, and uh, and one bathroom, and this tiny little kitchen and living room. I, I mean, you could hardly, two people pass each other in the living room. So, uh, but they lived there for a while until they could finally find a house. And so, um, after we moved to McMicken Heights, I guess my mom's allergy, she got some terrible, terrible allergies. And so they wanted to move closer to the water so that uh, the air was a little cleaner, and uh, that's that's why they uh, moved out to Burien and they built that house. So, and I was six when we moved into there. Um, I started first grade at Lake Burien. I can remember visiting with my grandmother. I was probably six years old, and she lived on a farm in Pennsylvania. And we, they didn't have indoor plumbing. We had to go use an outhouse, you know. And for some reason or other, I guess because it was so different from anything that I'd ever seen before, it just really stayed with me all these years. So. Yeah, we lived in a, in a well, it was a small house. It was like less than a thousand square feet. The yard was big, and I remember growing up having, um, uh, as was typical of. The depression, because we had the depression and we had wars, and parents went all through that. Our parents 
were deeply affected, particularly by the Depression. They had gardens and uh, raised chickens, and, and, and uh, I remember going out to, to uh, collect the eggs, and, and, uh, and then we had to kind of harvest the chickens, you know. Uh, I remember that at, at a very early age. So I was up here at the age of two but as we progressed on, and that was probably my, my memory start shaping up maybe around six, five or six. The roads were all dirt roads, and uh, as was typical of most things then. And, you know, a stoplight was a real unusual thing. We had a lot of freedom, too. Uh, so, yeah, you did. You and your brothers did, yes. Yeah. Well, it's one of the differences between uh, being raised a boy, maybe, or just the way we were raised is, you know, we, we would get up in the morning and we'd just take off. We'd go hang around my buddy's place. We'd go... We had a field out there that we kind of leveled out as best we could. We played baseball and that. That was a lot of fun. Uh, messing around like you do when you're kids. And, and uh, most of the food that we had was a lot of it came from our own yard. You, we didn't, we never really bought chicken or eggs or anything like that because we had them. For special occasions, we'd have chicken dinner. Or, or just once a month we'd have chicken because you got to harvest the chickens anyway. But talking about the chickens, I remember our neighbors when we were still in McBicken Heights had chickens. And uh, their their daughter, would, her name was Cookie, and she was I think a year older than I was. And so they were going to butcher these chickens and just being shocked that they chopped this chicken's head off and it could run around without its head. And it was just gross. <laughs> well, when I was seven, we, uh, our church was in um, was St. Francis, which was way off in Cedar. And my parents, and we were raised Catholic, and, and they were uh, you know, very devout. And uh, so we went to catechism up there and all that, and then they opened a the school up up there. And so it was a real problem getting me to school. And my brother Larry, uh, my two older brothers are 10 years older than I am. And so about age, about third grade, I started at um, St. Francis. And that put, you were living here and here and you moved here and I moved here. Uh-oh. So that's how we got living closer together. Was was when the parents moved. Out. We moved to Seahurst, which was not very far away from when they where they were. I never got in trouble in school. Yeah, ever. right. I, I heard about did. your stories. I never got in trouble. What about that story you keep telling? How you were so embarrassed because they said you pulled somebody's hair. Or Oh, it was. I guess I did get in trouble. I take that back. I, on the bus, this girl kept hitting me every time. Every, it, this is first grade. And every morning on the bus or in the evening, she'd be picking on me. And I finally just took a hold of her braid and yanked it. And she told the teacher. And the teacher stood up in front of the room and the whole class and said, it's just really too bad we have a girl like this in our classroom. I was just mortified. Here this girl had been pounding on me for her weeks. And I finally <laughs> stuck up for myself. <laughs> and the teacher embarrassed me so bad. <laughs> I was Mr. Straight Arrow. Ask her. Yes, he never. Too straight of an arrow. <laughs> older than his years. He never was a teenager, really. <laughs> At least so first that grade, still, so they, have, they would have a first bell and a second bell. The first bell would go off, and that means they had to wait a few minutes, and then the second bell, and you run a stand in line. So I ran a stand in line, I was fast. So I'd get up there, and I'd be right there in front of the line. Well, this one kid got tired of getting, being second in line, so he shoved me out of the way, and I thought, Got me get in line and shoved me up. Well, the teacher only sees, it's like football. You know, the referee only sees a second foul. And the same thing as her, you know, I was 
called out in front of the class and shamed and oh, I was felt so bad. I, 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 uh, <laughs> all of my experiences, I sort of bubbled to the top. So I was I wasn't just a patrol boy. I was a captain of the patrol boy. I wasn't just a, an altar boy. I was a head altar boy of all that. I wasn't <clears throat> just the baseball player. I was a captain of the team. And, and so on. I wasn't just in the play. I starred in the play, Tom Sawyer. I never thought anything about it. Just, well, I think that the, the, they shove you in these roles. I didn't ask for them. They shove you in all these roles, you know. But those seemed to naturally gravitate to me throughout my um, early life like that. But I was always really a quiet kid. Most of the people were blue collar workers, laborers of one sort or another. My dad was a, a church salesman, so he had a, a suit and a tie he wore every day. And I wanted to have a job where I could have a white shirt at a tie. I didn't know what that was, and because uh, that was that was really special to me. The folds we had were what? the rotary dial phones attached to the wall, or sitting on the counter, and that type of thing. You know. And they were party lines. Oh, and the party lines. Yes, we had had to pick up the phone and listen to make sure nobody else in the neighborhood was talking on the phone. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. And you would use the operator a fair amount to, yes, to yes. get hooked up to what Leroy's number or yeah. phone numbers that didn't have area codes or anything. You know, we were the only area. Uh, My mom's family was all back east in New Jersey. Um, my dad had one brother and I had my grandmother and one cousin, and they were very small, you know. We didn't get a lot of gifts. Um, we always had turkey for dinner. I mean, they all, mom always, you know, tried to do um, and make it as special as she could, but um, they were very, very frugal, you know, and they- All products um, of depression. You know, we didn't get a lot of, um, toys and things. I mean, we would get maybe one or two presents and that was it. And so it's not like it is now for sure. But uh, yeah, most of our holidays were pretty quiet just because we didn't have a lot of family in the area. So what about your clothes? Oh, my mom made everything. She made all my clothes. And Same I was me. so excited in the fifth grade. Store bought clothes they bought me a dress for Christmas. Store they actually bought, clothes bought a dress. Really special. But you know, looking back on it now, my mom was a great seamstress. She did a beautiful job with, with her sewing. You know, it was, really was a special thing, but when that's all you ever had, I guess it doesn't seem so special anymore. But like the uh, word was turned, uh, handmade stuff is the yes, good stuff. Yeah. And the store-bought stuff is, oh, is that China or India? Uh, <laughs> but we would go down to um, a store called what, Wigwam? Oh, yes. Yeah, Big Mom was kind of like a, I don't know, <laughs> a strip <laughs> plus store or something like yeah. that. Or the Sears bargain basement. Yeah, we, we, get, we always called it the junk basement. <laughs> yeah, that, that too. And so we get things like jeans, or, you know, we get these fancy Levi things, we get pants. Then when I went to grade school, of course, we had uniforms, so we had to go in and you know, we wore the same uniform. And we would celebrate like Thanksgiving. Uh, with the, with the, uh, it was probably, it was a, yeah, I do believe it was a turkey dinner. It wasn't one of the big chickens, although it could have been. And then Christmases were always special. We just couldn't wait for Christmas, couldn't wait for Christmas. No, 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 no. And I uh, got a Daisy Red Rider, shoot your eye out gun, uh, beep gun. They were always special. But the, the gifts weren't anything fancy at all. They were cars or fire engines. And so we would go out in the yard and in the dirt and, and make these elaborate towns with uh, roads and then they went up on a hill and, and we'd play for hours with those things. <laughs> we went camping in a smelly old campus tent. No, we did. We um, 
we did a lot of camping in the mountains and hiking and up into Canada. And then every other year we'd take the train back to New Jersey and spend a month with my grandparents in New Jersey. And so, and then of course my dad couldn't get enough time off work, so he stayed home. And uh, just my mom and my brother and I would go. So, and that was, I had, um, my Aunt Betty had four children. So we had cousins that were close to the same age that, you know, so we had somebody to play with and that sort of thing. So, um, and I think I was probably, um, I was probably 15 the last time we did that. So, and then of course, once we were in high school and everything, my mom just went by herself and we stayed home, so. But that was pretty much it. I just remember freezing in a tent in a sleeping bag up in the mountains. <laughs> so never go out with me again. No, no. <laughs> Motorhome is more my style, I guess. <laughs> well, our vacations, I don't recall that we ever went. We went I, I know we went to Yellowstone uh, once. And I got the mumps or something like that. And, and, uh, I, and I do remember with my brother, we were playing tag. But then when we went, you had to draw an arrow to where we were and draw another arrow here. And so the, so the one that was, was ready or not, here I come, would follow those arrows and go around and eventually find where you were hiding. I know my, my, my brother, little brother's turn. And uh, so he went out and, and, and drew the arrow thing. And, and, then go, and, I, and all of a sudden, I, the arrows stopped. I go around the corner, and here was this big bear in a garbage thing there. So he was, he, he beat, beat it out of there. Meanwhile, uh, uh, it says, oh, nothing. Pete, don't fail me now. <laughs> oh, oh, one of the things that we did do every year, on the 4th of July, we would go down to the ocean and we'd rent a cabin. Cabins are interesting. They got a wood burning stove in the middle of it that you could cook on if you wanted, and they had some bunk beds uh, that you'd bring your own uh, sleeping bags. Sleeping bags then were awful. <laughs> awful. <laughs> the most wool things, and, 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 uh, but then we'd, we'd go outside and we'd go down and dig clams. And then we'd come up and we would make this big, huge pot of clam chowder over a, a, a fire. There wasn't any, any uh, gas stove or any of that kind of stuff. And so that was a special thing. We did that every year. That was our probably our closest we had to a, a traditional vacation. The ocean was not far away. It was about 150 miles west of, of here, something like that. And then, uh, and then my dad had a company picnic called the Prudential Picnic, right here at Cottage Lake, usually. They would have uh, this hay bale spit out with they put money out and it would change all that kind of stuff. And then we go out fishing in a row. That's where I learned how to row a boat. Uh, when we finally got TV, we had a black and white TV. It had a screen about about this size, our, and a cabinet about the size of this chair. Uh, and there were not that many programs on. And then we, so we watched that, and we could listen to the radio. I used to have that this little, had this little crystal radio. I, sneak into my bed at night and I'd listen to that thing and listen to the music stations and, uh, and the uh, radio with the shadow nose and all that kind of stuff, uh, classic radio stuff. Man, she was pretty. She, <laughs> she still is pretty. And, uh, I was smitten, I guess, and never got over it. Yeah. So we were in the eighth eighth grade, I think, and we finally did meet each other. And Our paths crossed at probably roughly age 13. Uh, it's 14. 14, yeah. Mm -hmm. We never did go to the same school. Oh, I, I, he was in private all of his school years, and I was in public. <clears throat> Talk about a small world. Um, on our trip back from New Jersey, I met this girl, same age as I am, and come to find out, after, you know, three days on this train, she went to St. Francis and lived like four blocks from me. But I didn't know her because I went to public school and she went to private school. And so we got to be really good friends 
and stay friends, to, even out of high school, for quite a little while. So. But so 13, and then we're 73. It's been a few years, yes. Wow, long time ago. We were just best friends then. For a we long time. Friends through high school and all that. really well in grade school, grades and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and so they were, and I was gonna to go to the seminary and be a priest. And so the, the teachers and the priests there encouraged me to go to Seattle Preparatory High School. And uh, so I ended up going to prep and then I would, uh, my folks, I don't know how they helped, Pay for that. I might have had some scholarship help. I'm not sure. High school was all the way to Seattle. They weren't no freeways then, and it was it was a it was a, a commute from hell. My dad worked up by uh, Prudential, so we could get uh, a ride, which was in Seattle. I could get a ride in with him, but I had to find my own way home. And I would typically get home at seven, eight o'clock at night because the bus connection didn't. And the bus just did come all the way out where we were, so I had to walk. And, and you, but you went. You had a junior high school. I went. Yes, I went to junior high school. So you went from grade school to, to a junior high school to high school. Yeah, and then uh, uh, as a sophomore is when I started high school. So I went to High Life. So it was just a typical normal high school. Nothing special about it at all. It's still there. And it's still there. And Seattle was, Prep was an all boys school, but it, it no longer is. It's a it's a co-ed one. Everything is COVID now, pretty much. I had my first car when I was 13. My older brother gave it. It's a Crosley. Look at that. It's a crazy car. Learning <laughs> uh, to drive was the biggest thing in the world. That's why I can't understand these millennials. He says, well, I'm not, you know, I guess I might drive one day or whatever. I couldn't wait because I was a car freak then. I'd sneak on the streets and drive up and down the block and get run back to the driveway because there's got to be a cop behind every tree, you know. And I would get my cars going and I'd hop it up and see it kind of making a little faster. And I'd sit there and see how long a patch of rubber I could lay with that thing. And that was at 13, 14. And then, uh, and then uh, uh, when I reached 16, my dad would, would take, take us out and let me, let me drive the big car and learn the rules of the road and then read that little manual, the driver's manual. And so we went down to take the test and uh, and the side of this little building was was all caved in. And so some lady took the the test earlier that day and, and uh, not only did she put it in drive instead of reverse, she, what she thought was a brake was the gas pedal, you know, right through the wall. My dad taught me. I was, um, I was 17. I didn't get my license at 16. I got it at 17. So, um, and then I had a 56 shift that they got for me. I paid for half of it and they paid for half of it. So, but things would break and, and we couldn't go buy a replacement part or this and that all the time. So we learned how to fix things. And I finally got a job as a mechanic, but it was in a small shop and a different kind of thing. We learned a lot, so that's why I learned how to weld and how to you know, operate a lathe and, and, and skills like that. Lou's down Lou's. in Berrien. It's a hamburger yeah. joint. Yeah, yeah. I don't even think there's Lou's around anymore. No, they're, the, the Seattle Prep, they had a, a Dick's and the Berg, which was Burgermaster. Mm -hmm. no, it's for the Burgermaster known throughout the whole like, region. Yeah. It's up by the University of Washington. So there, there's a little more affluent crowd with, with some of the prep people. Prep was considered the uh, sn snooty school, and O'Day was uh, was not. So yeah, those were the those were the hamburger joints we hung around. And then we would go to Spuds. 
Oh, an Alkai. Oh, Alkai, yeah. yeah once in a while. All right, we go for rides. Yeah, we drive the loop around Alkai. That's where, yeah. in the summertime, we, we all, love going we for hunt. drives. Yeah. We'd hang out down there. I'd go out there with my girlfriends and our baby oil and iodine and spend the day at the beach <laughs> frying in the sun. <laughs> I worked um, at um, it, well, it's it's like kind of like Baskin and Robbins, but it it was an ice cream place. I did, it was called Chamrock Dairy, and it was out by the airport. And I worked there my senior year. Yeah. I worked in a uh, I mentioned a, a place called Bailey Freebuilt, and they worked on small motors, lawnmowers, uh, electric motors, and and. Uh, all that kind of stuff. And so that is, uh, I had that job. That's where I started to figure out what I really wanted to do for a living. And I worked like six days a week and as a commission basis. I had a long drive to get there. And, uh, but I'd get all, all dirty and greasy and go home. And I was so tired. And then I, you know, get cleaned up as best I could. And then come back the next day and get dirty and greasy again. And then get, get someone cleaned up and go home. And I said, you know, I don't want to, where's the wet dream of having a white collar job, you know? Our senior party was at a park somewhere and it was a miserable, drizzly, rainy day. And they had a band and, and they finally, they had a covered area where we could go and dance and that sort of thing. So. Yeah, I had the ceremony, um, there were a couple hundred kids that graduated when I did, and it was like in the gym. It wasn't, you know, we didn't have it anywhere else. Um, so whereas now, you know, they go uh, rent out these big places, you know, because some of the schools now, like Ryan, I think there's like 6,000 kids in that school. I mean, it's a huge school. So, but we were, you know, a fairly small class, so. Yeah, it was, I, I do remember after graduation, I <clears throat> had some Jim Beam whiskey. Never in my life had I had anything like that. We were out at Saltwater Park and this nice young man was holding my head while I was puking over a log. <laughs> and oh, I thought, I'll never drink again. <laughs> that was just awful. I was so embarrassed and so, but anyway, I sp had spent the night a bunch of us spent a night at one of the girls' house because I couldn't go home. <laughs> that was probably the the biggest thing that I remember is just puking. <laughs> that was your first experience with alcohol? Yes. We'll have to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> my first experience was uh, my friend made some home group. Oh, and gosh. So uh, he bottled it all up and said, let's give it a try. Like that. Man, that was powerful stuff. No, I was. I was <laughs> Graduation for me, um, well, we had graduation from um, from grade school, which was, uh, you know, you, they made a big deal out of that. But when I graduated from prep, I think he was probably in the uh, auditorium as well. You know, the cap and gown. And it could have been, it was one central location where the whole archdiocese had all the Catholic schools together. I don't recall. And there, there were no senior parties and well, I'm sure there were, but I was so far away that uh, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't a part of that. I went to school to be a hairdresser. And I finished and I worked in a, a, a shop in Kent. Gosh. I don't know, maybe for a year. So yes, I can remember my mom telling me, girls don't need to go to college. You're just gonna get married and have kids. So you just need to find something to do that you like, you know, until that happens. And so that times have changed so much <laughs> since then. After high school, uh, of course, I went to uh, University of Washington College. 
And uh, about that time, the Vietnam War was breaking out. I was at a very draftable age, as were all my friends. It was it was tough at the University of Washington because a lot of people you get a student deferment if you were attending college, and so that was pretty sought after. But the university was getting overwhelmed by people uh, there, so they were. It was hard to stay in college at that time. Things changed later. The old anti-war things started kicking in, and, and, and they uh, became havens for. Uh, keeping people out of the draft, and they know they could do that. I got a, um, I guess you call it a job, the houseboy. So I, I moved in with this family, and I do the dishes and clean up the house, and, and they had these dogs and whatnot that this big area, and they crap all over the basement. I had to clean that, and I had to clean up all the dishes, and I hardly interacted with the family at all, you know. And then uh, I was really lonely, and then. Some bad things happened. Some really bad things happened. Uh, my dad um, got, we'll say, got sick. But we go into the details. And he died. I mean, I was just my dad and I were really close, and so now I was really alone, really alone. I didn't have any local potential, any friends. One day I finally had it. And I just. I opened the window to my room and stuck out and jumped in my car and drove back home. Moved back in with my my mom because my my dad had passed away and uh, just never recall feeling so alone. The universe is huge, mammoth place. I think I told you this story, but I'll never forget it. Well, you get that draft notice, your jaw drops. And so, um, well, I was an I was an engineering student, top of my game. So we were an officer out of me, so I went in there, took their test, and just breezed right through it. Um, this is going to happen. I may as well make the best of it. And I, I was done right away, and. Uh, I was of the first, if not the first person. And so, and there was a lot of people, big warehouse full of these people that were being drafted. And so the guy, Zilgate, uh, come with me. And he went in and opened a, uh, a door to another room, met a massive amount of people sitting at the table. He says, I want you to help these guys here. And so I went over to help some one of the guys. And he's he's looking at this. Test questions. I think there are a lot of them. There are multiple choice or this and that. And, and so you know, he, he, he looked up at me and, 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 and uh, I'd, I'd read the question to him and then he'd say, "Oh, okay." Well, he he was he was illiterate. He couldn't read and he couldn't write. And the whole room was full of that. Well, here I had been going to private schools my whole life, basically, up to then, and and the whole thought that there was. Somebody my age, 18, something like that, 19, that couldn't read or write, flabbergasted me. Well, then how do I help the guy? I can't tell him the answer. Um, I can say, well, I don't know, what do you think? I don't know, what do, I, what do you think? And I, so I, I kind of um, steer a bit. That was a huge eye open mirror to the rest of the world for me. I went in and you do the physical part of it. And they did the eye test, and uh, I flunked royally because my eye for like 20, 250 or 20. I mean, you know, the big letter was hard to read, so I wasn't good enough to get shot. Legally blind, basically. Yeah. It was driving me nuts. She keep telling me about all her boyfriends and this and that, and I had girlfriends and whatnot. And then I, I would disappear for a while. I just couldn't take these stories anymore. They're just driving me nuts. And, and so I said, you know what? I'm just crazy about this woman. I got to do something. So I said, I've never really pursued her 
She was always my best friend, good buddy. I never really pursued her like a girlfriend. So I switched gears and started to pursue her like a girlfriend. Well, she right away uh, had similar feelings and boom, it clicked. And it was, it was magic. We just, we both lost times. All we could think about was each other. Now at this time, I went to work for Boeing. So I went to work just deburring parts, but then I got discovered out in the shop. And so this uh, big PhD guy says, hey, you know, you, you shouldn't be out here doing this stuff. And he says, how'd you like to go to work in our research lab? I said, sure. So I did that, I got a great job, uh, another big ratchet up the ladder. And then we, we, we just spent every waking moment together. We'd take the top down, we just, you know, neither one of us wanted to be apart. It just, it was uh, something, it was just really something. And then I popped the question one day and she said, no way. Oh no, that was a, we were both so and then, um, one of the things we did was, I had a lot of friends who got married because they sort of had to, you know. I, was, I said, well, we're going to wait because we, um, we weren't that way. We were traditional, you know, and those kind of things that are for after marriage, after you're married. So we waited a year, and that was we had a very long engagement. And we only waited, we were engaged six months. How much? Six months. It was too long. Your parents um, started chipping at you then. Yeah, they weren't. Well, you're too young. He said, sure you're ready to be? I was, I was 21 and she was 20. And by today's standard, that's pretty young. It was really young, yeah. And so finally, uh, I sat down with her parents and had a talk with them. I don't know if you were there or not. You probably weren't. I wasn't. And I said, look, uh, she's all upset. She thinks you don't want us to get married. She said, I don't know. Uh, you're not going to find, if she's going to find anyone better than me, uh, show me the criteria, uh, you know, basically. You know, but we're going to do it with, with your blessing or not. And, and things change, our relationship changed with the parents. That's when I sort of moved into the adult world when that whole episode happened. So we got married and got married in, in, in church, big nuptial mass, big formal thing at, at uh, high noon. At that time, that was the latest you could get married in the Catholic Church and have the nuptial mass. You yeah. couldn't, because we wanted an evening wedding and we couldn't do it. Yeah, so, uh, so, boom, we were together and we moved into a... It was a trailer. I mean, it was a trailer. Yeah, <laughs> mobile home, I guess. It, it was a trailer. It was like our motor home is bigger now. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, uh, a little, well, it was 50 feet long and ours is 34 feet long, but, yeah. but uh, that's all we needed. So I went to work at Boeing in the, the reproducing document area, and uh, I was there probably a a year. I, my friend Jeannie had gotten married just before we did, and her husband worked as a contract engineer without a degree, and he got jobs all over, and so that's when we moved to Texas, because he got... Yeah, married. he came over, we, you know, we go play what, canasta or something well, like Well, we play cards and, yeah, and, and all that kind of stuff, peanut And he one. said, hey man, I got this offer, you ought to, you ought to do this. I said, well... I'm not an engineer, I haven't finished my degree. So don't worry, I'll write your resume, yeah. they'll get you in. Yeah, so they fudged uh, his I resume. I said, well, you've had enough classes <laughs> to know the design work, and can you, uh, I barely had some rudimentary drafting courses, and I ended up jumping on a plane, first airplane ride in my life, and I was about 21 years yep. old. Flew all yep. the way across country, it was in February or something like that. Yeah. Cool there, got out of the, Plane in Dallas and hit with that 90 degree day. <laughs> and I stayed home and worked because we didn't know how this was going to work yeah, out. So yeah. I stayed. I was convinced I was going to get fired any second you were going to. So all I did was I worked. I worked a ton of overtime, made a ton of money, made, made, made 
at that time. They got per diem. So I did really well there. Uh, and, and so you were there like about three weeks and you said, okay, I think I can do this. You need to pack up the car and the dog and come down here. So uh, cleaned out the trailer, rented it out to, I think somebody you worked with. Egbert. Yeah. And so they were renting the trailer that we lived in and I, we packed everything we had in this a good little Barracuda car. <laughs> and so I drove from Seattle down to Dallas, the dog and I did. And my dad- Packed everything we owned was in that car. Yeah. My dad sat down with me with the map and showed me, okay, you know, which was the best route to take. And so, and they said, stay in, you know, nice hotels. Don't, you know, stay in a little dive somewhere because you're by yourself. And so I called them every night to let them know where I was and that I was okay. <laughs> yeah, my, they were not happy at this point that I was doing that. So um, it took me, what, f three or four days, I think, you know, to drive down I there. remember when <laughs> she called, we talk, you know. I remember when you arrived, you were just, I know, and I was lost. I what was Grand Prairie, and I, I, I was lost. And so I, I knew I was in the right town, but I didn't know how to get to the apartment that he was at, so. They came and got me. We had this, our little dog that was our family. Yeah. A little poodle. A little poodle. Michelle. And yeah. oh man, when you rolled in there. Wow. That was really special. Before um, Scott was born, before I was even pregnant with Scott, you started flying lessons. Oh yeah, that was a huge thing. Yeah. Oh, that was a life changer. Yeah. So, I have these passions that come and go throughout my life. <laughs> and, and, and they're- Obsessive uh, passions. And they're about <laughs> everything you could think of. So it might be photography this day, or RVing, or it might be, uh, uh, this case was flying. I didn't go to the flight school, I taught myself the you know, I read books and all that. Took he got my, the manual my that he was supposed to, that the test that. was based on. I mean, and then I would take my flight, my flight lessons, and I and I got my pilot's license. I was kind of still a really quiet kind of guy, you know, very quiet kind of guy. But when you learn <laughs> to be a pilot, or when you're a pilot, and you are responsible for someone else's life that's with you, and you got to make and you're the one that communicates with the outside world, you know, the tower and force control and all that kind of stuff. You step up your game quite a bit for, and it gave me so much confidence, so much confidence. And then I finally ended up buying a plane down there. Yeah, a little track racer. Yeah, uh, they didn't have permanent tie downs. So they had these like five gallon buckets full of concrete that they tied so that they tie you down to, well, airplane to pick that, fly that away, well, some tail dragger guys took, the, the big windstorm came through, yep. he went through there and just whipped that tail around because he had his tail tied down, wiping out some classic planes and, and then my plane wiped it out. So, uh, you know. Yeah, it was not, not nice. Yeah, that was, that was, uh, that was cool. Our life down there in Texas was, completely different yeah well too and the fact that we've never lived anywhere but here you know it, and the climate everything down there is so different i can remember going to the grocery store and people moved so slow i mean everything the pace down there was so slow and i'm a get this done now 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 you know and it's like why did i mean they, they need to move. They need to get this done. So, I mean, it was really an eye opener about how different, different parts of the country, how different people are. Nice so. people. Really oh, nice very people. nice people. Oh, but right. it just was a and, much and, slower paced life. And, and, and you, nobody wore jeans. You'd get dressed up oh, to go out to the mailbox. Yes. You know, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it really, I'm sure it's not that way now necessarily, no. but back then, no. man. It was a very yes. proper, uh, proper area. <coughs> it, was, it was cool. It was a great, it was a great thing. It was thing. a good experience. It people, was good people, for I, both I think of us. The joke used to be that the, the, the all, the Texas are the 
most of Texas are the most obnoxious loudmouths that you can ever run into uh, elsewhere. But the Texas in Texan, in te Texans in Texas, really nice. People. They're very nice. Really people. Nice very people. friendly. We've got a lot of friends down there. Yeah. We were about a couple years into that, we said, you know, maybe it's time to start a family. Yeah, well, yeah. I was due September 1st, and Mom flew down on, um, I saw the, probably on the 30th. I'd been having a backache all day, and so I went to airport, went to Love Field, picked her up, and took her to the apartment. In my, Dallas. Sir. In Dallas still, yeah. My back was just gone. <laughs> You know, <clears throat> and I had all my labor in my back. I, for some reason or other, I was just not aware that, you know, it was possible to have labor in your back. I just always assumed she just got this gigantic stomach ache and, you know, that was it. I, it must have been sometime in the middle of the night that I realized that, okay, this is not just a back ache from being pregnant that, that I was in labor. So um, she had gotten there in the afternoon and then he was born the next morning. And so, but... God, I was so upset. Well, they gave me some kind of drug that, I, you know, I didn't... And then they were trying to, you know, the, and they were just manhandling her around. And, <laughs> and then I thought, you know, these guys are going to kill her. Kill Linda, try to have this baby. Yeah. Yeah, they were just... Well, and, and um, they kept me in the hospital for four days, you know which even back then was unusual, you know, two to three days was what they normally kept you. But uh, he was seven pounds, seven ounces. He was perfectly healthy and all that. So uh, we went home to our apartment. My mom stayed for, what, I think three weeks and helped out, you know, those first three weeks. So not knowing anything, I, and I mean, we had information available and all that kind of stuff back then, but it's not like it is now where Everything is so open and, you know, people aren't afraid to talk about stuff, you know, like they used to be, you know, things were private. But Scott, we had, we moved to this apartment, uh, to a bigger apartment in the complex and uh, had a big pool. And Scott used to, you know, jump in and swim underwater. Oh, he, he, the pool. Yeah, he would kick and barely walk. And he, he was in that pool, swimming. Underwater, all that kind of stuff. I tried to drown him. <laughs> Didn't happen. So he was probably, I want to say, maybe eight or nine months old when we bought our house, our very first house in DeSoto. And down there, things are all brick. And it was a brand new house. It was Beautiful a, house. Brick with really, a shake roof. Was really all nice. hand, um, cabinets were all handmade. Yep. Uh, really nice. Yeah. So. But then, after we moved into the house, he got laid off, which is part of being a contract person. When the contract is over, your work is done, and so then you went to work in San Antonio. Yeah, I picked up the phone. What, what you got going? You're, you're always on top of your game then. But there was a lot of layoffs for over the years, and I survived most of them, but basically, we finally uh, were through building or designing what we needed to design, so uh, uh, that contract ended, and, uh, and so, now did we travel the country after that? No. Uh, we, uh, after, it was after we sold the house. You went to work in San Antonio and then commuted on um, the weekends back and forth? San Antonio is like 275 miles, it's like commuting between here and Spokane or something. No, it? it wasn't that far. Wasn't I don't there. think so. It was a ways. It was a ways, but I don't think it was that far. We got a trailer and we thought, okay, we're here. We don't know how long we're going to be here. What's going to happen? So we're going to see as much of this area as we can. It was a camping trailer, RV trailer, yeah. not a trailer like that. Not like we, we lived in a living in. Pretty no. nice apartment. <laughs> so, um, so we did. We went all over Texas, Louisiana, um, Arkansas, Arkansas. Yeah. Um, and and did. I mean, we did a ton of stuff down there. So I'd, I'd be working all these, i work working all these hours. So what we do is we wait, and then when I got off work, we'd leave that night and drive and drive and drive and drive, camp by the side of the road, and drive and drive some more. And then we'd go down to Galveston, for example, at that time on the beach, or we go to 
some of the skate parks, or a lot of the things were free then, the, the Corps of Engineer ones. Yeah. We had a canoe, that was another boat yeah. we had. We'd go out and uh, after work or, or run and we'd go canoeing in these different places. And, and so we had to uh, be very careful with the kids. Like you fall in and, and I don't want you getting into the boat. So I had Scott there, you know, I don't know if we had Mark. No, we didn't, this is only Scott. And so uh, don't you move until we're ready for you. We'll put you in there because we had to load up our little ice chest thing. So we picked him up and I put him over, set him on his nice little mound that he could relax in. And, and, <laughs> and he starts- in Texas. Yeah, and, so, and all of a sudden he starts crying about something. Yeah, kids are always crying about something. Oh, and then he started screaming. Yeah, so- uh, He set him on a red ant hill. Yeah, set him on we a red ant. Grab him and <laughs> drop him in the water. Red ants are not friendly. <laughs> Very old. I mean, he was pretty little. It's affected him ever since, so he's never. <laughs> but he was either, you think it was either him or Mark that was little shoes. That was, that was God. God. So, that was his name. Scott's name was Little Shoes because he put his shoes next to mine and, and he was <laughs> called Little Shoes. So, we were going to go to see the Dallas Cowboys play. And uh, I don't know, he was old enough to walk around with, so he drove the car out there. Five. And it parked way out in the middle of nowhere. Oh. And man, we're never going to find it. So, Scott, you, see, you got one thing to remember about today V5. V5. That's how we were parked. The, uh, <laughs> he still Kirby remembers Stadium, it. Is, <laughs> to this day, <laughs> you ask Scott. Where they where, were parked. Where, 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 they, where were they parked at the first time you went to Conway's Inn? He will know. <laughs> Never forgot it, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yes, we you went to this Chinese. so mad. We went to a Chinese well, restaurant. No, it was a Mexican restaurant. Well, it could be any of those. I think it was Chinese with that hot sauce. It was sauce Mexican. Stuff. No, it was a pepper. It was a jalapeno pepper. You said it told him it was a pickle. We were in a Mexican restaurant in Texas, and you said, here, Scott, try this, it's a pickle. And it was jalapeno pepper. I remember it being the uh, Chinese what? food, and you, you dip in that hot mustard stuff. And oh, no, pepper. no, no. It was pickle? It was, yeah, it was pickle. Your attack cat got me. <laughs> they attacked each other. They totally did right under you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, well. <laughs> You never let me forget that for the next how many been fifty oh, years. That was so mean. <laughs> the more than fifty years. Yeah. Then we got a motorcycle then, so we had something to run around in. That's when I got my first motorcycle. Yeah. Uh, and and then we went down into Florida. And we were sitting on a beach somewhere in um, City, I think it was. Uh, somewhere. Somewhere. I don't there, remember. Right yeah. There. And um, and it was December. Do we have Scott then? We had Scott. Scott was and we two said, you know and what? I was pregnant with Mark. I'm so close up to getting the last year of my degree or year and a half of my degree. Um, uh, we're going home and finish that up. And it was like December. Or, it was December because we headed for Seattle and Christmas we spent in a Kmart parking lot. I put a turkey, a little turkey in the oven in the, in the trailer. Yeah. So. Um, the pickup truck wasn't like a, my pickup truck now, which has got four doors and dog out thing. It could be a hotel suite of its own. It was a yeah. plain old pickup truck and we just <laughs> strapped us all in. We put a mattress in the bed of the pickup. And then when Scott started getting restless up in the front, We'd stop and he and I'd go in the back. We had his toys back there. I mean, we'd be okay. arrested now for doing that. And he and I'd be sitting in the back of the pickup and he'd be playing with the toys and he'd be able to stand up and move around and all that kind of stuff. So, um, while yeah, driving, right. yes. And so, so we did, sorry, the, the way the whole way we, <laughs> the whole way we lived our youth. If you did it today, they'd throw you in jail for yeah. child neglect or breaking some kind of law. <laughs> yeah. You know, we were 
the free we come and go where we wanted. We were a little kid. We, yeah. Yeah. So, we did. so anyway, we we headed back to Seattle. And we moved over to your folks. Yes, over to where my yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you tried to get into the U, but it was too late, so you went to Highline for one quarter. Yeah, I had to go, go. but I went for a um, a quarter at Highline yes. in College. Yeah, and, took and made <laughs> made a pregnant snow lady in the backyard. In that winter, we had a ton of snow when we were staying in my mom's front yard with the trailer, and so he made this pregnant snow lady back there as I was <laughs> pregnant with Mark. Pregnant with Mark. Yeah. <laughs> My mom and I had taken Scott shopping. All of Scott's baby things were left in storage, and so I didn't have anything for the new baby. And so she and I had gone shopping, and Scott was so active that I had to put a harness on him and a leash. And he was pulling me all over the store. And I don't know whether that, I mean, I, he was a month early. My water broke in the middle of that night in the middle of the night and so we went into the hospital he was like five pounds 12 ounces he was teeny tiny Smart. yes yeah. i mean they sh they they put me out for him and they were holding him up after i woke up and holding i mean this diaper wouldn't even stay on him it was like it was falling off the skinny little and i remember thinking when i took him home oh this poor baby he is so homely I mean, he was so skinny and just di didn't look like he was ready to be here, and he wasn't. Um, but uh, yeah, once he filled out and everything, he was good, but it was just, uh. And so we stayed at my mom's until September, and then we found an apartment in on Capitol Hill um that we could manage but it was a one-bedroom apartment um, so i saw on the, on the bulletin board to you you know <laughs> and so for free rent you could go and manage your apartment and so here we had two kids and one bedroom apartment yeah and he he needed to and he was in school and so we had this big walk-in closet that was big enough for a crib and a dresser so mark spent the first year year and a half or year of his life in the closet and um we get and scott was we had the bedroom then eventually the both the boys ended up in the bedroom and we had a fold-out couch in the living room that we slept on so but we were there until he graduated a lot of stories with that apartment man there were some oh there were some real like, horrendous <laughs> things you know we were kind of on the borderline of this sketchy part of Capitol Hill and the nicer part of Capitol Hill. I mean, we had somebody, well, when we were moving in, this is the, the I mean, there was um, our building and then an alleyway and then another building. And so we pulled our, our truck up in the alleyway there to unload all of our stuff. And pretty soon this, it was on the kind of a hill there. Yeah. There was a hill in the back and a, a wall, a cement wall. And pretty soon this guy comes running and jumps down the, over the wall and he's running down the alley. And the next thing is the policeman with a gun in his hand, jumping down over this wall, chasing this guy down the alley. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what are we doing here? We we're moving with two, with a baby and a three year old. Our lives were so plain, you know. What are we doing? <laughs> So, I mean, it was, yeah, and I mean, and then in the apartment, oh my gosh, was it on the third floor or something? That guy got pissed at his girlfriend and threw the TV out the window and it landed in the middle of the night okay, right outside about, our bedroom not window. Not like these TVs now, they're big, there's a big vacuum tube. So when he oh hit, my, it, it, it exploded. It, it, oh yeah, it was. It, and, then we the found, and then we found sandy whatever her name was drunk on the stairs one night passed out we had somebody try to rob us once. and yeah and then we had somebody i mean actually went through the glass front door just crashed right through it this thing i mean glasses in that we had i was like oh we were so, right near the ghetto type of area yeah. right there in that borderland yeah there. it was it was just uh, well, and we, it and was hard though because we were city folks you know we've been all in the suburbs and not in the country and yeah 
And, and there was no place for the kids to play other than inside the apartment. There was no, no grass, no yard, no nothing. So anyway, that was probably the, the lowest part of our marriage Going together. back to school, everybody talks about all the cool, my school college memories of the rah-rah and secret handshake. <laughs> That's what we That remember. wasn't us, man. <laughs> we just wanted to get through that thing, yep. get the credentials. And, and yeah, get out of it. <laughs> get out of it and go earn a living and raise a family. You know, it was tough. It was yeah. really tough. Yeah. So, but, but I mean, I'll, I really will have to say that's probably the most interesting part of our lives oh, as far as... Yeah. Wait, we're just hitting the high spots. <laughs> yeah. just, so, but anyway. There, I mean, there are probably some things that we remember we wouldn't tell you. <laughs> was, well, you know, and the hard part though is he'd be in school, he'd come home, he'd have to study. Um, we'd get the kids to bed. People move out of the apartment, so here I am after everybody's in bed and he's studying. I'm upstairs cleaning dirty apartments that people have moved out of so we could rent it to new tenants. And, I mean, it was not not an easy time. It really no. was probably the hardest time of our entire marriage. Yeah. Um, we did a lot of one day things where we'd take, go up to Snoqualmie Falls and had a backpack for, like for Mark because he was too little and Scott would walk and we'd walk, uh, hike around the falls or up at Mount Rainier and we did a lot of that stuff. We went camping, there's pictures with my mom and dad, they took their trailer. North Cascades area. Right yeah, yeah. And, uh, and we took our trailer and we went camping with them. So anyway, he finally graduated and we were out of there. <laughs> <laughs> my graduation ceremony. That was my other graduation ceremony. What was it? Nothing. I made it mail it to me. Yeah. Mailed me the ship. And I was gone and started interviewing for jobs. And went to Texas again. Uh, <clears throat> boy, you hired me right away. I worked for board for one day. Yeah. And uh, I accepted a job with DuPont all the way down in Texas. Texas. Orange, Texas this time. Way down on the Gulf Coast. Mark was two and Scott was four. Well, we went down there, we lasted what? Less than a year. And we decided, you know, this is where we I can be. get a job anywhere. This is not where we want to raise I mean, our kids. You walk out to the mailbox, the humidity would be so high, you'd be soaked by the time you we got said, back you know, I mean, it just was not. Let's just, let's just go, I pick up the phone, I pick up a job shop, I think I got a job with Learjet, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. Was it Kansas? No, it was an LTV again to work on the S3A airplane. Oh, and that didn't last long. And that didn't last long because that's an anti-submarine plane. And then I then I went to work. We, we moved to um, Arlington. Arlington, Texas, which is between Dallas, Dallas and Fort Worth. Worth. And then I got a job with um, uh, a contract with Learjet. Kind of cool thing. I, I had the coolest job ever. So we had, uh, down in Texas. 18-foot uh, day sailor. Yes, we, we, we bought a, a, a day sailor. And I bought a, it's kind of a hot rod boat. Uh, it was a, um, a sloop rig, which means it had a jib in the front and a you know, mainsail. And then... We had some fun with that. Yeah, and it was, it was and, and the keel would retract. The trailer was a light boat. And so we would go out in the lake there, and the lake went out into the Gulf of uh, Mexico. And lake so, Sabine. Lake Sabine, so I worked for DuPont, right? And so we were heading out there one day, and... Um, uh, it started getting rough. Yeah. yeah you know, so we decided to turn around and go back. Yeah. And so he's turning around and... Well, there's commands and everything associated with it. Some people don't listen to commands well. Um, there's a whole story about that. Oh, well, Another anyway, that, that's a different different story. But anyway, we're going around and the boats, you know, sailboats tend to lean one way and the, the one side's up high and the other's down low. And you get on the high side so we don't, yep. And it's got bail in. And so I, I went, oh my gosh. And I went in after him. Well, 
because my weight is no longer on the high side, the whole boat went over, right on top of us. And, and, and it didn't have a, 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 a it didn't have a keel. The centerboard fell keel. through. The centerboard fell through, and now they were under the boat, trapped under the boat. And, and then Mark and I <coughs> were on the back, and I was hanging on to my... There's nothing. Push. It was a fiber. There, there's it, nothing to a, hold on to. It's kind of a race sort of boat. There was nothing to hang on to. Hang on to there, and there were, you couldn't hang on to the to the centerboard. It was gone, and, uh, and I was hanging on to him. And uh, I don't know, we had our life preservers. We, he and I did not. The boys did. The boys did. Always did. Yeah. <clears throat> and so um, we were calm. And what, what happened when you were underneath the well, boat? Well, I mean, there was a little pocket of air under the boat. And I, you know, Scott, having been in the pool so much when he was li really little, little, I told him, I said, okay, we have to get out. So I, I'm going to push you down underneath the side of the boat and we're going to pop up on, you know, up on the surface. And so he said, okay. And so I pushed him down and I went with him and we, we came up on the outside. But there again, so to hold on there's to. nothing to hold on to. There's the little rope rings that you could stick your finger in to hold on to. Well, he had taken Mark and flipped him up on top of the bottom of the boat that was up. And he's screaming bloody murder, you know, because he doesn't know what's going on. He's two and a does. half. What yeah. was he, two and a half or maybe, maybe yeah. three? And there's nobody around. No, and we're out of nowhere, <clears throat> drifting and, out into the Gulf of Mexico. And so, pretty soon, there's a helicopter going over, and <clears throat> we're we're trying to hang on and get these, make sure these kids are okay. And uh, there was a boat that was a huge boat that Crew was boat coming. from the oil rigs yes. that were out there. And so uh, they tried throwing the life ring over the to us. <clears throat> And I mean, it was so far away, we couldn't let go of the kids to get the life ring. Finally, some guy jumped. I mean, it was a huge jump. He dived into the water, got the life ring, came over and got the kids, got them up on the boat, then came back and got us. And meanwhile, <clears throat> a speedboat, you know, that was out, a recreational boat was out. And he got the sailboat and towed it in to where they could flip it upright again. I, I never did. I don't even remember that boat coming to get it. I know that we went well, I know they, they told us where it was and yeah, we got yeah. it. Yeah, and when we got it, it was, was upright. We couldn't but, sleep for days. Oh, I mean, it was. We that could, could have been days. just we tragic. Lost, I mean, uh, yeah. We lost the kids. We lost my lot each other. Yeah. So, it, was, uh, it was not, that, not a good thing to No. So, anyway, that was not, I, I mean, that's something we won't forget. It was not a good experience, but it turned out to be okay. But um, So, talk about somebody who doesn't listen well, <laughs> doesn't do well, <clears throat> doesn't like the tone of your voice kind of thing. <laughs> so, we were in Lake Sabine. We had a little, little yacht base in there. We had our, our boat tied up there. Yeah. And it, it's a little, it's a, a, a bay. Uh, you have to come through. But you got to go through this little slot between With the rocks. rocks. And, like Des Moines, uh, coming into Des Moines there. The sailboat has no motor on it, okay? And so the wind was coming straight through that slot. Well, sailboats don't go straight into the wind. They go at some angle, depending on how good you are uh, and how good the boat is. And so um, you have a command, you know, and, and uh, we had the jib on the front. And then tell her, and then you say, ready about, and that means you get ready to, what they can say, come about when you change attack. And then helms the lead. Then I would, you put the helm to the lead, throw it over hard, the boom would come across, the sail would come across, you'd have to come across, and then you go, there's a lot of happening there. And of course, when the wind is coming in, it's coming like crazy, and I'm saying, uh, so I'm trying to get through here, and I had to time it just right because there's, you don't you don't see well the, the slots this wide, but you're coming through at an angle, so you only see this much of it. And I said, so, ready about, ready about, and I'm coming right towards the rocks, you know. Ready about. We gotta we gotta come about to get through this. I, I don't like your tone of voice. You're yelling at me. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean tone of voice? Obviously, there was a lot more that happened before. <laughs> This game. That's what happened then, though. I'm trying to I'm survive. Going, Don't you yell at me! 
yell at me. You can't, you can't talk to me like that. I'm the skipper. What are you talking about? That's how skippers talk to the crew. <laughs> <laughs> we almost went on the rocks. No, we didn't. I used to race them down there. I raced, I raced boats, raced I, that one a little bit, but I had a friend who had catamarans. He was a kind of a dealer thing, and so he he put me up on his catamaran and teach me also when I'd race sailboats. And I'd race, I would crew on sailboats, bigger boats, the bigger ones. We'd go out in the Gulf, and I'd, I'd, I'd race those uh, with them. Kidder. Right, so I was working at, uh, at Learjet for Australia, what they call rotor non containment. Once again, a uh, this time it was a Learjet, which is a well known business plane. I worked on that for a while. And then finally I said, well, let's go home. So I picked up the phone and Boeing hired me back and I, I got back there for a while. Well, Scott started kindergarten in Arlington. He was five and Mark was three. He bought the property where our house, existing house is now from his brother when he was 18. So we had that property already. And so when we came back, um, we rented the house in Federal Way and started building on the property. And so uh, once the house was done, then we moved in there. And Scott started first grade. And we, he was, we moved in in August when, and Scott just had turned six or was turning six. So he started yeah. first grade there. Yeah, okay. Um... <laughs> You know, they didn't do the ultrasounds and stuff like they do now. And the doctor told me the last time I went in, he says, Oh, this just feels like a nice, healthy little boy here. And I'm like, Ah, oh, we had two of them from a family of four boys. <laughs> and so I, well, and that's why there is the age difference between Mark and Lisa. We just, I, I had to be all right in my own mind that it would be okay if it was another boy. I, I couldn't go into it thinking it's got to be a girl. So, and we then, actually, and then, oh, too, and then my water broke. I, I was we, there for this. I was in the operating room this time. Yeah. And, and so my water broke at like 530 in the morning. And so they said, well, you need to stay home until your contractions are so far apart. Well, I, I was probably like five o'clock at night and we thought, yeah, this is, an, there's enough of this. I mean, and nothing was happening. So we took the boys to my mom's, dropped them off and just went to the hospital. And I stayed in the hospital but all, all night, and then the doctor came in, I don't know, like 9 or 10 in the morning and said, you know, this baby is just not ready to be here yet. And she was two weeks over, or two weeks early. And uh, so, but because my water broke, they induced her. And so she was born that afternoon. And, he was in there with me, cried when, because the nurses all, believe it was a girl. All the nurses all knew that I we wanted a girl. That we had two boys, and they Good just all—they didn't even have to say anything. They just went, oh, and you know, and so I still and, cry I, when I see her, <laughs> but for a different reason. So anyway, so we were both just ecstatic that we finally had the girl. So. I, once we got a boat, that was pretty much all we did was boating. I love fishing. I would go in real dangerous places to fish, but that wasn't a family thing. And so I made the conscious decision, you know, what would be a good, and then we also made the decision, we're gonna lose these kids. Well, they, you know, get older and discover boys, discover girls, girls, discover boys, and this could be some family thing that can keep us close knit. So we, so we got a, uh, our first boat was a little 24 foot. Right now. Right now, which was not a, uh, a great cruising boat. Yeah. So that would have been, you were about 78. That was uh, actually uh, tradable. Yes, we had that. Well, well, the first two boats, we could trailer. And they were big. The second one was 20, big to trailer, 20, but I had the truck. And, was and it 20? 20. The first one was a 24, the second one was a 25, but it had a fly bridge on it. Yeah. That's pretty good size. Yeah, and then we went to the 29. 29. And then 32. And the 32. Yeah. But all our vacations were spent out on the boat with the whales and the seals and the fishing. Well, yeah, we just loved it on the water. We, we got away from fishing. We just liked just hang around and suck down wine, I guess. 
Oh. And remember uh, going out off of Stewart Island and the whales? The whales going yeah. under the boat yeah. and coming. You got that great picture of the three whales spy hopping on the back of the boat. Mm -hmm. well, we and <clears throat> all the crabs that we'd get, you guys would go out in the dinghy with us and we'd pull that crab pot up and <laughs> there'd be crabs running all over the dinghy. So, so morning we'd get up real early to go fishing or, or get an early start to, to move. And it, it can get pretty rough out of the sound and choppy and windy and up, but in the morning, it's just nice. flat. Oh. And then you'd see the sunrise right up in the water and the birds moving around and it was just great. Lisa and Anna sneaking wine out of the wine box <laughs> in the boat. You were like 18. <laughs> yeah. Um, Going up to Desolation Sound and all the jellyfish, it was a squirrel cove mm -hmm. and all those jellyfish Desolation everywhere. Sound is, uh, is in Canada to the north of us and it's, it's, like, it's like boating in the mountains. And the water is it's 70 degrees, there. which is not down here. It's, it's the lucky oh, here, it's yeah. 50 degrees, 40 degrees. Desolation. Now, desolation, that's a long trip. Yeah, it is. And it's, uh, and you have to go through some crazy seas to get there. Across the Straits of Georgia. And that's when, you know, we're going across. Do you across remember the, when we went and, and we got thing. partway across the Straits? And the, I mean, you look out the front window and all you could see was water. Yeah, I know. And so said, when we went back and we found that little uh, cove thing to... We, we had to head back. Yeah, yeah. it was so That's rough. where the famous chant came up. Charles, get me out of here! <laughs> like, like I wanted to be there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. That was not fun. That was scary. It really was. The other one was... Um, we were coming back through the Swinomi Slough and down around Strawberry Point and the water, I mean, it just got so rough and we barely made it into... Um, yeah, so, okay. So we were going from um, uh, north to south heading home. Yes. And we had power boats, right? Which yes. all we had then. And... Uh, the, Somebody we, were, that was with us had a yeah, power... Yeah, Bob and Margie. We sold yes, their they, or, or, or Rymel, I think, yeah. or the other one. And, uh, and so <clears throat> normally you go down this big long straight, but uh, this way, would this, but we, we went around this south. corner of yeah. Woodby Island, there was a Navy air base up there and all that kind of stuff. We got around this corner uh, of uh, Strawberry Point, I guess, so, and we got hit full force. And okay. once you get in that stuff, you can't turn around because you turn sideways and you'll roll over. And so we worked our way around, uh, quartering the wave, and then we had <clears throat> to turn into the harbor, and I had enough power. Following seas. Following seas. Following seas is what capsizes. You go down and the sea picks up the rear of the boat, and you broach and you roll. And so we, and, we, and then one of the boats broke down, and I was towing it. So we had to help get them in there. Bob and Marty, you know, and, um, and that was like kiss the that ground. Was, that was when pretty, we got in, it was that was, that was really, really scary. big rollers. We were sliding down in front of them. And, yeah, and uh, yeah, that was that was not cool. That's one of the ones. But when you get inside a, uh, a safe harbor in the in the, um, in the story, man, it's there's no better feeling. <laughs> Uh, you pick up, the, I never read the paper. One day I pick up the paper and here's an ad for somebody looking for somebody like what I have these skills. Same thing up with an airplane I was buying. And so uh, I called the number and I, and uh, the guy the other, the other end was the president of the company, that's Larry Hansen. So it wants me to Denny's just talk. Well, he gave me an offer on the spot. And so I quit Boeing and I went to work there as their, uh, you know, basically head designer, chief engineer, and... Uh, and Lisa was five. And that was for a very small company. That was a good experience in my life, but then the company got acquired by somebody else, and the acquisition didn't work out. So um, from that, I lost my job because I didn't, couldn't make it with the new owners. I just didn't like them. And, and, uh, my not a good fit. Yeah. And so I was crushed. I've never lost a job in my life. And so I looked around and I got a job. I ended up getting a job 
as a uh, the director of engineering for uh, well research that a research company. Uh, that worked okay, but they started running into some financial and management redirection things, and they were laying off my boss and other VP. I, I reported directly to the VP, and so I was, we were getting nervous now. So I picked up the phone at Boeing because I'd made a bunch of contacts when I was there, and went back to Boeing, and I ended up working in all these spook areas. A whole lot of stuff happened. But I, I did okay, and I ended up retiring from Boeing you know, when I was old. When I, then, then the year 2000 hit. Mm -hmm. What happened then? Oh, it's before 2000. Okay. You were 50. I was 50. And he, they found prostate cancer. Got cancer. Well, all of a sudden, all this other stuff become irrelevant. All this tons of hours you put in, all the jobs you had. It's completely irrelevant. It's, uh, what am I gonna do about that? So, we went in and had the operation. It looked to be a success. And I had a good medical plan then. A lot of places I didn't have medical. None of the kids had. Lisa's this, the only one this, that we had medical insurance. Yeah, our stuff, the we, boys, uh, we didn't. We just paid out of our pocket. We ended up retiring then and then, uh, uh, no. I did not retire then. No, was you were good for four years. And yeah, then... that was like nineteen. Because I retired in two thousand. My cancer came back after they took, they took my prostate out. My PSA started rising, and uh, what happens is, what that happens is, they didn't tell me about this. Is um, if that comes back, it is essentially incurable. Average lifespan seven to ten years, and that was in that was in the year two thousand. Right, and so we retired. Yeah, at 50. And, uh, and then we uh, started looking around and uh, hunted down the best place we could find in Seattle for treatment. And they, uh, I signed up for every research thing they had going. But they managed to keep me alive with the combination of some research stuff and some, you know. Tried and true drugs. State of the art stuff. That was a big part of our life. A lot of our, a lot of our life was chase the kids around when they yes. start getting, you know, old enough to join sports. A lot of our time was consumed. Basketball, baseball, all the way until you were a junior. Junior. You, yeah. yeah. Now Scott and Mark. Scott wasn't big into the. Uh, yeah. Mark wasn't well, big into sports. Well, they did when they were younger, but then they started working. Burger King and Ivers. Yeah, I will say that Burger King and Ivers. Uh, Mark worked at Burger King. Scott worked at Ivers. One thing I was forever impressed is these kids had a super work ethic. Man, they were not late. They were uh, work right hard. Oh, yeah. yeah, they were really, really good. And Scott, uh, when we were going somewhere, and he spilled the. Oh, he was getting ready to go to college. <laughs> spilled hot grease on his foot and just burned. I mean, burned it. And yeah. had to go to the and have the dressing changed at the doctor's every like every other day or something. And here we were taking him over to college and over to WSU and had to leave him there. We had to find the infirmary and had to get it set up so he could get the dressings changed on his foot. Our first baby going off to school and we're leaving him there yeah, injured. Did, didn't he fall down and hit his chin on the coffee table and bite all the way through his tongue? Oh, he was too. Too many did that. <laughs> that was Mark that split his head open while we were at the tavern. Oh, it was Scott. Mark was the one that took care of him. <laughs> Kevin, <or> Kevin. <laughs> we were at Jocko's. You were coaching oh, yeah, this, yeah. the women's soccer team, and Jocko's was our, our sponsor. And so after practice and after the games, we'd go to Jocko's and have a beer or have a glass of wine and we let the kids home alone. <laughs> and Mark jumped no scott jumped from the top stairs so they were seeing how the high freeway. how many stairs up they could go so you go down a set of stairs if and you jump, jump you're going to hit and split the, 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 his head the, the, the floor we get the home and there's an aid car in the driveway and scott's been <laughs> bleeding all over the place and the neighbor calls us and says you need to come home uh, good parents <laughs> At the tavern 
drinking while they're cutting their oldest son. Yeah. Their son. <laughs> Which to the end, or the, probably the child services people take our kids away. <laughs> if we were lucky, that could have happened. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we sing happy birthday, and it's kind of like everybody chimes in and sings. It's, we all sing happy birthday, but we just don't sort of start at the same time, and, yeah. and we don't end at the same time. Well, you end at the same time. We don't always have the same words. So it started with, them, I think it was when the, little, the kids were little, one of the kids couldn't really say, we were trying to teach them the words, but then they'd get birthday, have birth, until we started singing, and then everybody come with their own versions of, so said happy birthday, birthday, have, and then people start laughing and singing over, and the little kid, I don't remember who kid, I was, I was holding them, we were standing next to the table. Probably there. Lisa. Yeah, and, and everybody laughed, and then, so every birthday, since then, we, we sort of got honed the thing. Everybody could hardly wait to get that song and put their version in, but the important thing was it sort of started at the same time and ended at the same time. And, and but nothing um, else was the same. Yeah, and it's, it started with a half and it ended with a day, but the, in between, the, the worlds got moved around, the timing was in there but everybody was really happy about it. So it turned out to be a joyous Giggle. celebration rather yeah. than just yeah. droning along with the song that's been there for a thousand years that nobody pays attention to. It has no character whatsoever. <laughs> so uh, we've done it for, God, for eons. Uh, it's been a long time. Yeah. First motorhome was, we actually borrowed well, your folks, didn't we? Uh, yes. And so, then we borrowed Scott's. Well, we had, we, so we had, we, we had always had trailers. And then your folks, uh, um, well, they had a trailer in when they were coming back from California. They, my dad, I don't know exactly what happened, but it, it flipped. And when they do that, they're just totaled. And so after that, um, they got the motorhome. There was a place they always went in Carpinteria. Yeah. And they changed the rules, it had to be a certain length. Well, I was traveling down there in business, and I went down and talked to the ranger and everything. And I said, hey, you know, if you, here, is a, here is a motorhome that will fit. And that's your favorite spot. And so uh, they went out and they got that and they went down there and then so, they said, hey, this is a family thing, kind of the way we think of art, but, um, you know, it's not just for us, it's for everybody to use. And so we're usually real reluctant to do that, but we uh, we borrowed it and- you know, We did once or twice. Yeah, yeah and went out in the motorhome, and went down to California, I think, mm -hmm. and did some things there. And then, um, uh, and then we, uh, it had problems with, well, and then grandma had dementia, and so they weren't yeah, talking they anymore, couldn't use it. and so, so they just said, So they kind of, well, it. why don't we keep this over here? So I, I basically bought it off of him. I mean, basically, I bought it off of him. So then we, we uh, once we bought it off of him, then it had some problems that it tear the whole front end off and had dry rot and Leaking, yeah. a bunch of things like that. But it also had problems <clears throat> with the transmission. Mark and Kim borrowed it. Oh, and, yeah. and they were going up Siskiyou's and it quit on them or something like we that. We had to do that to us too, though. And we had to oh, we had to install, well, we had one place. Well, it's about time to find a place to stop. Let's go over here. And we go up to Grapevine in California. And then we get they up. said there's a campground up and the road got worse and worse and washed out, sort of in one place you could bear to me. But got up to the top and they had these signs everywhere. Bubonic plague. Bubonic plague. You know. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I've never seen anything like that. Yeah. Criminy. Uh, so, so we yeah. started to head back down there. And, and that was an interesting. We ended up just kind of pulling over in a while. Yeah, hanging spot. half off a cliff. It was really yeah. hard. It was a narrow road. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that was, a, that was, was an another adventure. Another adventure. Yeah. So then we finally, uh, uh, Scott got a motorhome. And so he let it borrow it, and we, we took that on a vacation or two, even. Oh, I don't, I think we only took it once. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a, a real nice one. 
about the same size, 25, 26 feet. It only had a slide in it. Yeah. And then we, um, but then we went to a, a RV show and, and, and we saw all these RVs, and, but they were great big, super expensive things. One that we found the point is, geez, this isn't that bad. I thought it wasn't cheap, but. Um, and, but, and, you know, it didn't have any slides in it or anything. We said, oh, we can afford this and we don't need a slide. And then we started looking around yeah, at the same you know, brand. Or, but you could get one with slides in it that was, you know, I mean, it was not cheap, but it wasn't as expensive as yeah, some of the yeah, others. So there, so, uh, we, we got, got a super deal on it. Yeah. Uh, so there, you know, every class, those are called class A's. And then we started using that and we had lots of adventures in it. Lots yes. of adventures in it. Yes. How many, how many times did you, so she was always driving one and we'd have something like the fire oh, would God, gonna blow yeah. out. Something always <laughs> happened when I was driving. Don't go we don't go in here. We don't do anything. And the kids know that, so they spoil us. And they send us on these places like I've been this Alaska cruise or to yeah. there. Or yeah. Scott and Kim asked us to babysit their kids when they went to Hawaii. And it says, well, sure, that's what grandmas and grandpas are for. Just, no, you're going to come with us and do it. And so we stayed in the snooty places. And, and, yeah. Supported by our tour. We did all kinds of stuff. There were yeah. the horseback riding the mountains. We went out and did all the tourist things we've never done in our life. Um, you know, went to, on, its, on its boat out to this island and, and uh, like I said, we rode these horses up in the That's way up in the mountains. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and but we, it was cool. And, and we and we we'd take the bus into town and walk around the, the town yeah. and it was it was it was a lot of fun. That, and then was, you and I went on a soccer tournament there. Mm -hmm. You came and played soccer with my team. Port of Ireland? Yes. You mm -hmm. played down there, really? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. I was the ringer. I just stayed home. I had to work. But that's what we do, Jeremy and I. They have all the fun. <laughs> we work. Yep. They are good people. Yes. And they they are, they follow the rules. Yes. Oh, pardon. <laughs> what do they do? They are all, all successful, but they are just good people. And they, um, you know, they hassle us a lot, but they, they care for us a lot. We've had some things happen, even in particular, that um, they're there. They're just always there. And... Uh, yes, we can count on them. Yeah. <clears throat> for sure. But they're just, they grew up just solid, good, and successful people, and with good families, all of them, good families. It's so much easier and so much more fun when they're your grandkids than it is when you're when they're your kids, because you're so conscious of you know making sure that they're good people and turn out right and all this kind of stuff. Your grandkids, you can spoil them and give them pop and give them stuff they're not supposed to have at home and you can send them home and they'll never <laughs> tell. Mom and Dad's problem to make Oh, they always tell. Oh, do they? Yeah, they're all good kids. All the kids, oh, no. kids are really good. All, all the grandkids are just... Uh, yeah. They they're all different. Yes. Well, I can funny. remember when Scott and Kim called and uh, they said, they were telling me, you know, I think you were there when they called. I'm oh, never there. Yeah. But anyway, I can, I, they said they were pregnant. I can remember just screaming. I was so excited that they were pregnant. And then I don't know what happened, but we got disconnected. <laughs> so, but anyway, yes, yeah, so it was pretty exciting. Um, I was home. I think I was, I was by myself. I don't think you were home and Mark called and he kept calling me grandma and I I, I said yeah I'm you know I know I'm grandma but I, I mean the way he was saying grandma it, cause Melissa yeah. right but the way he was saying it and finally he said Kim's pregnant and so I, I was so shocked I remember Scott called me with Taylor I don't remember how we found out do you remember how they told you about Nikki yes Ryan, uh, what's when we were taking care of Ryan, and Ryan came in, and uh, I, 
I don't know that it's Mark, but came and prompted him, do you have something to tell Grandma? And he said, I need big brother. And yeah. so he was like eight, maybe 18 months old. The great yeah. brother sisters. Too. Yeah. And so, but I, and then, and then with you in that quilting book, I can't believe I was so dancing. Hey, yes. <laughs> you came over for dinner and uh, we were sitting outside. It was in the summer and we were outside at the table. <laughs> and uh, you say, oh, look what I bought. And you showed me this quilting book with baby quilts in it. And we talked about quilting before that. And I, it just never clicked. And you finally had to tell me. <laughs> it's a baby quilting book. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, for some reason. And then with uh, Gavin, uh, Carter had on a shirt. You were the one. That Grandpa, out. out of the, the most least observant <laughs> person yeah. in the whole family, was the, was the one. one person that figured yeah. it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not for a while. When uh, she was pregnant with Gavin. Because uh. <clears throat> we were up in Anacortes. Mm -hmm. And what did the shirt say? Uh, was it the same thing? I'm going to be a big brother? Yeah, or this something? little monkey's going to be a big brother. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah. Okay. And I still thoroughly sure enjoy the kids. I enjoy them. sitting down and playing games with them and doing stuff with them. You know, they're they're really fun. You you the things that we're worth proud of, you still want to do stuff with us. We had kids move in with us that couldn't get along with their parents at all. And so they move in with us to kind of get through that. But you kids would still want to do stuff with us, you know. You you you, you stay in touch and either that or they just pretend. Well, they pretend. Yeah. And they, um, you know, Scott and I go on these great adventures, and we go on adventures with Mark. The one that I get rekindle my motorcycle thing. I want to get in that Jeremy on that uh, wow. dirty face thing. Oh, well, first of all, you see, he was riding these motorcycles all around. This motorcycle's all around up there by Lake Wenatchee, that those trails and things. And then Mark uh, was, was always wanted the motorcycles because I never let him get one. I know, he was so, he resented us to no end because we wouldn't let him get a motorcycle when he was Now he's got a garage full of them. And, Such a middle uh, child. That's when I sort of yes. said, well, yeah, that's something I could do with, with the kids. And um, we try to be as active as we can. Yeah. And, uh, like, like you started this whole thing, how old are you? Well, we're 73. How old do we feel? Not 73. No, not even close. 20 years less than that, maybe. We tend to feel with the age of the people we're with, because you can't see yourself, you know. So you feel like you're, uh, you're the age of the people you're looking at. <laughs>